December uh, up until just before the 19th of January when Patton, 1819 January, when as you saw in the museum, Patton is going to cross the river, the Sour River. So the drummer's going to be in here for about a month. And then as the Americans come back in, uh, they're going to fight to clear the town. Uh, and the conditions here will be similar to some of the other places. This is but D-Kurt. If you can imagine hand-to-hand -hand fighting, uh, very close quarters sort of stuff. Uh, the Germans are going to use Dekirk as, like I said, as the assembly area for when they're finally going to cross back over into Germany. So it becomes a, a pretty important junction point for them. So the first place we're going to go is uh, a place called Foren, F-O-U-H-R-E-N. And I want to stop uh, just outside the village uh, and tell you a story about a uh, lieutenant there. Um, and I want to use, his, uh, use him as an example of bearing as a leadership principle. Uh, we touched on McAuliffe briefly when we were at Bass Stone. Uh, he's also somebody else that I would use as an example of bearing. Uh, but on the spot here where we'll take you, I think um, Lieutenant Christie does this, has a, a superb example of the importance of bearing uh, in leading your subordinates. So. We'll be there pretty quickly, and then I'll tell you the story once we get there. <coughs> this is going to be a, a quick stop, but I want to just get you out here and have you just look back down the road real quickly, and I'm going <coughs> to do a first brief account of um, what's going to be happening in this area. Inside the village of Foren here. The village is right here. The bad guys coming from my right to my left. The river's over here. American troops are also in deep curve where we just had lunch. That's the big American area at this point. On the morning of the attack, what's going to happen is because the, those, the regiment excuse me, is so thinly spread out, you're going to have companies billeted in all these villages. So you've got a company of the 109th and 4th and the 16th morning of the attack. And because there are so many Germans, remember, right at the start, you've got three battalions from the 109th against three divisions of Germans. There's no way that they're going to hold them at the river. So what the guys what the guys do is they hold these villages like little alibis. They try to hold out as long as they can. And there's a company that's trapped up here in Foren. And they send, they radio back to Dekirk that says they're, get, they're getting pressed and they don't know if they can hold the village. So they send this young Lieutenant Christie up here. Now he's been with the division only for a short while, but he caught the tail end of the Hurricane Forest, so he's actually been shot at. But his platoon is made up largely of replacements. He's gonna start coming up the road, and he's joined by two tanks from the 707th Tank Battalion. And just beyond that twist in the road there, the tankers stop and they can see gunfire falling on the town and a and small arms fire and it's pretty intense so they know something's going on and the tank commander just stops and says I'm not going any further because if I don't have adequate infantry support I'm not going in that town and some of his men overhear this and he looks back and they're all getting the jitters they're like uh, we don't know about this it's either recruits or guys that have been through the hurricane forest and I'm going to mispronounce this, so any of you who know Polish, I apologize in advance. But his sergeant is Stanislaw Wiesek, who's just joined the division. He's a tech sergeant. And Christy turns to the tech sergeant and says, let's get the men going here. We've got to get and support these tanks. And he says, oh, I don't know, sir. The men don't look like they can take much more of this. And he says, you know, if you're a sergeant, damn it, do it. And the, and the sergeant's response is, I got these stripes for her in a kitchen in Texas. <laughs> I don't know anything about this stuff. And things are starting to break down. And Christy goes to the tank commander and says, what do you need to get the tanks moving? And the tank says, one guy will do it. And he says, okay, I'm your man. And he stands up very straight and very tall in the center of the road. And he gets in front of the tank, the tanks, and starts walking around the bend up the hill into the town. 
the tanks start to move forward and he recounted that, you know, he said, oh, this is great. You know, I am scared to death. My knees were shaking. I'm all alone. What am I doing here? And he's getting closer and closer and all of a sudden he feels somebody brush him on the sleeve and he turns it as the sergeant. And the sergeant says, okay, Lieutenant, you made your point. And behind the sergeant is the rest of the platoon. So this would be a place where I would use an example of leadership example of bearing. Um, it's, very arch it's very easy to use courage as a leadership example, but I think that's demonstrated so often that it's a little bit more finesse than that. Christy, who's just as scared of the rest of, as the rest of the guys, maybe more so because he's been through the hurricane forest, realizes at that point he's got to do something and he stands up very formally in the middle of the road with proper bearing and walks slowly in front of the tanks and gets the guys moving in the town. And what they're able to do is extract the remains of that company out of this town and get them back headed towards Deepkirk. Because that initial, that first day, I said those Alamos are gonna hold up for as long as possible. But as Rudder and Coda realize the extent of the breakthrough, the next couple of days, all they're doing is they're sending out small detachments to try to rescue these guys from these different little villages from getting swamped. So they're gonna get, get the guys out of here and pull back. But they have artillery support. They have minimal, they have divisional level artillery support. But again, it's all along the front. So they don't have the artillery necessary to support every little breakthrough. So here he does it. But that's an example of making a decision very quickly and standing tall and setting an example that alters this situation because if they hadn't got up there, those two tanks wouldn't have gone in and more than likely, Rudder would have lost a company of men. So, I just wanted to use that as one brief example. We'll hit, we'll hit a few more as we go along. It's a pretty nondescript spot, but I think it's pretty neat that this guy kind of overcomes some pretty serious fear, stands up in the road, stands tall, and then just walks into the town with the gunfire. And again, you know, there are Germans all over the place, there are Americans, it's house to house. It's just a chaotic mess. And this is, you know, we're walking in. So, and the Germans don't have much in the way of armor support. No, but they're all walking in. So this is uh, just outside of Dykirk, or Dykirk. Southern shoulder. The Auer River. It's like a Ran across in the Germany. On the Luxembourg side of the border. It's called the Hosdorf Plateau. And it's up there that the 109th Division is going to be in various towns for <coughs> overlooking river crossings. Uh, the units that cross are again um, 352nd, 5th Fallschirmjäger. One of the first regiments across is the 916th Grenadier Regiment. And they are actually uh, the unit that had originally been at the Railville Draw at Omaha Beach. And, uh, so, and again, mostly recruits, not too many guys that survived the Normandy campaign, but a few uh, experienced NCOs and officers uh, are there. Uh, once we get over to the German side, I have some accounts of the crossing from the German perspective of Ulrid, uh, and then I'll try to get back up uh, onto the heights in Luxembourg so you can look down. Um, and then depending on the walk, we, there's some trails that we can go back into and you can see bunkers uh, and foxholes. But the junction point of the Arwa and the Saar rivers are right nearby here. At Wallendorf, where we're going to go, it's where the Americans first cross into Germany in September of 44. Um, so that, of course, had gotten an awful lot of press. Um, and that's going to be the area that when Patton finally launches the counteroffensive that they talked about in the museum, he's going to have to take this town back uh, in the high ground behind it. So the GIs uh, in Third Army are going to have to retake many of these bunkers twice. This is all part of the Siegfried Line fortifications or the West Wall that you may have heard about. And uh, this was originally built in 1940, for just before 1940. Uh, everybody thinks of the Maginot Line and what a quote unquote disaster it was. Uh, but there are two important points I want to make. And one is that the Germans were pouring just as much concrete as the French. 
uh, their fortifications were slightly different. Uh, and the Maginot Line, as a fortification, actually did its job. In those few instances when the Germans actually attacked the Maginot fortifications, they suffered really terrible casualties. Uh, the weakness, of course, was they didn't fortify up through the Belgian border. But that's another story. But the Westwall fortifications are here. Now, originally, when they were built, they were built for certain specific types of guns, mostly of lighter caliber. Those guns, for the most part, had long, been, long since been stripped out and used in, elsewhere in one of Germany's other many campaigns. Um, when they came back through here, they found that very often the, high, the larger caliber guns that in use wouldn't fit in all of the apertures for the bunkers, uh, but they still made ideal troop positions uh, and they could be used by machine guns uh, and they had mortar positions and whatnot. And also, you know, given the terrain that you can see around you, there doesn't necessarily have to be a big gun and a bunker on the top of one of these hills to slow somebody down. Uh, and all along the German side of the river, they had planted it with belts of minefields. Uh, they had maps for the men to get through for the German offensive, but when the Americans came through the first time and then the second time, they were crossing these dense belts of minefields. Um, minefield technology had developed to the point as well where a lot of the German mines were made of glass or wood. Um, some have had references to concrete ones. And these wouldn't have been picked up by metal detectors. So, you know, very often it would be guys walking out into minefields and when one guy gets hit, then they're going to have to prod them out with bayonets or metal rods. Uh, so you're going to have to clear that before you can even get into the bunkers. So it was a pretty tricky, nasty business. The 109th Division is pushed out of this area when Patton uh, goes back on to the counterattack. Some of the units that are going to show up here quite a bit are the 5th Division, uh, 80th Division, and 90th Divisions. So these are the units that um, are going to be engaged here, retaking the ground that's lost at the start of the offensive. Cross from our right to our left, they're going to be pushing down in the direction of the bus here, pushing towards up on the plateau and down this road, down towards Dekirk, uh, in the direction behind us. So what direction are we going now, Chris? Going north. Yeah, but what direction? Going north? Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't. Kirk connection. I could go behind it. Oh, okay. I'm all at work now. This is the one. No, I thought that's what you said. Is that off to our right? Power. Uh, okay, that's what I thought.
that was a sewer river and we're going to come up on the hour because they come together. Oh, okay. S-U-R, right? Yep. Sewer river. This is an account I'm going to read uh, from one of the German engineers who crossed here over to Luxembourg. Unfortunately, the promised bridge material had not delivered on account of supply difficulties, so that we had to build a wooden makeshift bridge that would bear the weight of the Hetzers, and those were the Czechoslovakian guns I told you about. The artillery fire began at 5.30 as quickly as possible with, with effects unimaginable today. Is today. Trees up to 50 centimeters in diameter were filled with axes, two-man saws, and power chains. They were moved down to the shore with, with winch line, where the actual construction of the bridges began at daybreak. Meanwhile, the numerous assault troops of Grenadier Regiment had crossed the high waters by means of rubber boats and infantry footbridges and were marching forward. We could clearly hear the noise of battle on the opposite side. Our first attempt to equip the bridge with a central pier built of lumber failed. Swift current at this point tore the construction apart even before it could be fastened. Since time was critical, the central pier was dispensed with, and the bridge was begun with two reinforced end piers. The construction of various components using improvised equipment and with the use of raw material went on until twilight on December 16th. Then we suddenly came under heavy mortar fire aimed at the site of the bridge. The American defensive fire uh, forced us to stay under cover for about two hours. Bridge building continued all night with artificial moon provided by heavy anti-aircraft searchlight batteries, sporadic U.S. artillery and mortar fire. The wounded taken by dozens to Dr. Kress at the bat battalion's command bunker. Torn arms and legs were amputated before my eyes and it was horrible. Towards noon of the next day, parts of the wooden frame finally could be joined together and reinforced after they had pushed across the hour. To increase the bunker's capacity, another layer of tree trunks was put over it. We did not know if the bridge could hold 25 tons of weight that, e weight. that evening we had reached the point at which the bridge declared to be drivable and the first Hetzer nervously drove over the makeshift bridge. It held. Tanks followed and several RSO towing trailers, anti-tank and artillery guns in tow. A great number of our engineer vehicles had been so damaged by American artillery that they were impossible to maneuver or totally useless. Thus we had only a few trucks to tra transport material as we marched further ahead. All through December 18th, other units of the division followed with their equipment, mainly artillery guns, most of them horse-drawn, a few full truck vehicles and supply trucks, as well as field kitchens of, for the infantry companies. The bridge had been absolutely, re, had absolutely to remain capable of being used, supplying the greater part of what remained of the 352nd. For this, we only had mortars and machine guns to defend the bridge. So if you look up on the hillside to the left, uh, you can probably make out some indentations in the ground. 
and some foxholes that are up there. The Germans would have been in position all along here, and they would have been there through September. Again, guarding the river. Um, as soon as they, they could push the Americans out, but there were tow holes on either side. The Americans were eventually forced to withdraw. There was a burger. Yeah. So we're going to drive along here um, and see if there's a way we can get up there. And then if not, we'll, we'll cross back over. But I wanted to give you an idea of the terrain uh, that the Germans came down uh, and had to cross through. Take a look to around. Now it's on the right. You'll see the rock formations. Uh, most of these are natural, but at spots, uh, the Germans would have used those, uh, carved them out some more, and put machine gun positions in them. So if you look carefully, you'll probably see some that have been altered. Um, after the war, they're sometimes hard to find because after the war, uh, the Allies came through and they blew up many of these German fortifications. They were too big to get all the rubble out, but they would try to make them unusable. Uh, in future, so you'll just see piles of rubble, big things of moss. Um, but again, if you go up there, you'll more, more than likely find uh, the remains of fortifications mixed up in amongst these rocks here. There's a trail that you can actually take uh, from Dekirk around. It's going to be about 20 kilometers, um, but if you go along the trail, you find all sorts of bunkers. Uh, tracks from tanks, uh, marks from tanks, um, and those sorts of things. Uh, but what we want to try to do is to get some spots where we might be able to get close enough to walk you in there, because um, it's a bit of a hike. But you can certainly get an idea of the terrain up there. I have listening posts and entrenchments up on the high ground that we just came over. They have machine gun emplacements up there, and they're going to catch two battalions of the 916th crossing right where we were coming up that hillside on the road. And because they prepared interlocking fields of fire up on that plateau, as soon as the Volks Grenadiers, or the Grenadiers get up there, they're going to open up on them, and they're going to hold them there for the better part of that first morning. Uh, just with basically machine gun fire and small arms, mortars, and they're going to kill about 400 Germans just on that plateau right there. So they're not going to get much beyond their crossing point before they're going to run into opposition. Now again, what they've been told to do was find gaps in the line, of which there were many, and go around these guys. But what happens is the first guy up top, guys on the top start to take fire. The ones behind him immediately come charging up behind him and try to engage these Americans that are going to be in these fortified positions. And because the bridges are being delayed in construction, they can't get any kind of vehicles. And the Hetchers are pretty lightly armored, but they are armored. But they can't get them up here. So it's infantry versus infantry, and they're just coming right across that field. Okay, so for those who want to take a little walk, we'll just go up the hill a little bit, um, get a better idea of the ground. We won't be up there very long, and then we'll get back down on the bus. Uh, the monument behind us is... Uh, a 28th Division Monument, you can take some pictures there, and we'll just be quickly up and back, okay? Twenty-eighth Division Monument. This is uh, Hausdorf. To the forest we go. Use for storage 
eight posts, command post communication centers, because this is the main feeder road that the GIs would have used to get up to the MLR up on the plateau where they caught all those Germans. So I'm going to walk up as far as there, but don't feel that you have to. But this is just going to give you an idea. I was saying, look on the right hand side, these kinds of indentations here. These all would have been used by the GIs for ammunition storage, communications, aid stations, that sort of thing. And this is going to be the feeder road up to the MLR. <laughs> so they're going to catch those germans in that field. So they're bringing supplies and ammunition up this, this road <coughs> and wounded back down. Germans are coming in what direction? This road. <coughs> What's the weather hey, like? Chris? The weather is cold, freezing rain, but no snow yet. The river we crossed right? So south, sure. And it's going to interconnect just beyond Wallendorf yeah. with the hour. Oh, back of the room. Yeah. Take a picture of those dropping out, eh? You can talk and pray to make it the rest of the way. I warned you. I gave you the option. Very underground. Are you there, man? Yeah, hopefully. Thank you, I've done it, Jack. Oh. Where did the bad guys came from? From that direction? Germans came from there. Where's Dan? As long as he didn't see it. We won't tell. Wow. The uh, third battalion of the 109th is going to be along this stretch of road in fighting positions. What we're going to try to do when we go back down is we're going to drive around and try to get access from the other side. And you can see a lot more foxholes and whatnot. But it's right here in this field from guns in those woods and along here that they're going to catch those Germans coming up from the river crossing where we just came. And as you can see, there's nowhere for these guys to hide. They've got no real support. There was a barrage in the morning, but they did not have the, uh, the amount of artillery that they had further north. And uh, some of the Americans actually said, well, they thought it was a light barrage, but they didn't expect that that was going to mean uh, that the heavens were going to open up. So it was not that bad. So they'd have the MLR here, they'd have listening posts further forward so they could see the Germans as they start to cross. And because they prepared interlocking fields of fire, they just waited for them to come up over that rise. And it just smacked them. And then rather than try to go around these guys, the Germans are just gonna keep launching wave after wave after wave across the field. And it's going to take most of the afternoon um, and the Americans will slowly fall back in order but they'll have pretty much wiped out a battalion. Plus the moral effect of all these German soldiers who on average age in this unit are 17 to 19 have not seen combat before. They're just at the start of the great offensive that's going to win in the war and half of their guys are dead less than a mile from the river crossing. <coughs> So it sucks the wind out of them. And, sure. and the river they're crossing down here is which Sur. river? The Sur. Okay. The Sur River is going to bisect with the Hour, just up from Wallendorf, which is where we were when we were in Germany. But they're going to be crossing both of those rivers. And that ridge over there is Germany. That's Germany. Yeah. So it's been something like a bonsai charge in the Pacific. You know, there's no finesse, there's no fire and movement. Um, I don't have an account of this here, but in several other places along this front, there are accounts of German NCOs or officers just blowing whistles like they used to do in World War I. And the guys, they just start charging across the field. 
that ridge, the uh, positions are going to run along there. Um, and then we're going to try to find a way to get back up top and see if we can give you an easier climb up. If not, uh, we'll swing down to Bettendorf and uh, we can cover some of the topics there and then we'll go on uh, to a few more a few more stops. <coughs> What is this I'm guy doing? Here. <laughs> he looks the other one. Right there, do not oh, use that. Yeah. So what's that sign say right there? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to see what's going on right in front. I need to know. It'd be okay if you could yeah. come from the other direction. Yeah. Okay. A few tons of ones for us. Is this the plateau here? Uh -huh. okay. Did I hear someone say that you bike through a lot of these areas? We, in, the, uh, in the Alps, we go the last six years. Is that a mouse? Yeah, there was a, there was a mouse <laughs> crossing the road. Mickey Mouse. Almost a squish now. <laughs> which way Okay. up on the ridge line where we just were. Uh, the Germans are eventually going to push them back to D Kirk and then beyond that to Echternacht. So this will all be controlled by the Germans until January. And as part of Patton's counteroffensive move, he is going to come up in this direction from our left to our right and make a crossing, make a crossing of the river with a small patrol. And that patrol is going to be able to let report back to him that the Germans here are holding this position very weakly from here um, down to Dekirk. And over the course of that next week, he's going to have Third Army clearing crossing points along the Sur River, Sour River. And then on the 18th, they're going to conduct that major crossing, which is going to take them back over the river. The idea being is once you cross that river, you're going to be able to get up onto Skyline Drive, where we were yesterday, and roll up the German positions on Skyline Drive, because as the Germans begin to retreat, the all roads are going to lead back to that river. So they're going to be up on Skyline Drive and they're going to be stuck there until they can retreat back across the river. And as you've seen, on ver very many of these crossing points, uh, the bridges are, are fragile, uh, if they exist anymore at all, and there are very few points at which German armor and vehicles and heavy equipment can cross. So Patton is trying to cap catch the Germans on the Skyline Drive. A lot of the Germans are going to m get out, but the Air Force is still able to go in and, and do some pretty fearsome damage uh, to some of the later arriving units. 
Hitler on uh, before that Patton's able to conduct this this crossing has made the decision that he's going to pull out what's left of 6th SS Panzer Army. So most of the SS troops are actually going to make it out of the bulge pocket. And it's going to be the remnants of 5th and 7th Army, particularly 7th Army, that's going to get caught along Skyline Drive. But that whole general movement is going to begin here at Bettendorf and then spread up to Dekirk where we had lunch and they're going to pin him up against the Skyline Drive. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The two other spots I want to take you to um, involve the initial phases of the attack. Uh, and I like to stop there. One is a really great story, much like the Clairvaux Castle story. Uh, and the other is an Ectronach itself. And um, it's a wonderful example. I know I've been talking a lot about how the Germans screwed things up. But at Ectronach, it's the lack of communication between American units uh, that lead to a bit of a disaster. Uh, something that was kind of talked around after the battle, but due to miscommunication and improper chains of command, uh, there are going to be co companies of GIs that are just left in this town, basically. Uh, and I'll, we'll make a quick stop there and talk about how that all comes about. So those will be, be our next two. But this, from this point again, on to Dekirk <coughs> is going to be where Patton is going to come up as part of that general movement. To, he wants to cut off the base of the bulge. You know, you've got three German armies trapped. He wants to cut off the base of the penetration and trap as many of the Germans as he can. And we drove down here because I just wanted you to see Bettendorf and then we'll go on. Uh, so from here back, again, 3rd Army is going to come up, 5th Infantry Division, 80th, 90th, and uh, Armored Divisions. So this is where Patton will affect his crossing. Now we talked also about how when Patton makes his move north, 7th Army, which is south of him, is going to have to stretch out. And many historians or and students of the war say that the bulge is his last great offensive and I kind of fall into that trap sometimes too. He does in fact launch one more offensive called Operation Nordwind. It's not a massive offensive, but what he hopes to do is to launch an offensive into, Hagen, uh, into Alsace and Lorraine, which is going to distract the Allies from what is happening up here. He had originally planned to launch that offensive in conjunction with the bulge, but they don't have the resources or the time to pull it off. But they do attack into Alsace, and that's what's going to draw the 101st down into Haganah to respond to that threat. Now by the time they get down there, the offensive has pretty much been stopped. But uh, that's what draws those guys down there. Um, during the fighting in that counteroffensive, by the way, that's when Audie Murphy uh, gets his Medal of Honor. Um, it's, unit, it's the unit that had advanced up through southern France. Um, July and August in the southern France and then into Alsace and Lorraine that are going to be involved primarily in that, that operation. But because Patton is distracted up here, the Germans are able to try one more time to uh, knock the Allies back, but that too is kind of defeated very quickly. because they're wading through several feet of snow to get up into these hills where the Germans have had time to set up a lot of machine gun and uh, mortar uh, and other fighting positions. Again, they're trying to delay Third Army long enough to get the bulk of their troops back into Germany because they do now know that now that the, the offensive, the Ardennes offensive has failed, that in the spring the Allies will be on their heels and they will be moving into Germany proper. So they want to get back as fast as they can with whatever they can. Uh, so they're going to leave guys here to hold up Third Army. Uh, SLA Marshall, who's the Army historian, 
during World War II. Uh, he's written a number of books. was pretty well known. Uh, he called it one of the, the worst, one of the offensives carried out under the worst conditions of the war for the men that were fighting here. So it was pretty miserable. positions we're going to be running along here okay. and then they have a position here so just you can follow an Ecternach he Kirk is down here Ecternach is here so these are going to be initial positions they're going to have company C P here D Kirk is down behind us if you guys want to circle around, I can show you where we are. I know we've been doing one of these numbers. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and they find him and they get to the last two Germans. So McConnell gets back in here, and then from the 16th through the 20th, this is going to be the Alamo, with Germans just attacking him constantly. At one point, they're going to send tanks fighting up through the town before they relieve. They come up through the town with these two tanks. As they hit the, the Germans in the village, they don't want to fight Germans in the village, so they go around the town this way, and they come out where this development is now coming together, and they start turning their turrets towards the hotel, and they can't contact the tankers, so one of the guys in the hotel starts running around because he remembers at some point when he was busy trying to rifle things, he saw an old American flag, and he's pulling doors trying to remember where he found it. He finds the American flag and they, they fly it from the front of the <laughs> front of the hotel, and they're going to actually act as as the flank for the Americans as they eventually push out this way and temporarily glare out the Germans. They're going to be here so through the 20th, and then they're going to start fighting back in this direction. But I thought it was a pretty cool story. Um, and I don't know how much longer the Park Hotel is going to be here. So. It's not going to be much very long. Those are the Apparently it's going to be senior citizens. <laughs> This is the Park Hotel in Burdorf. They have that uh, this rock lit up in the, at night. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's a huge rock that jutted out over the roadway. We start here in St. Pete, which is divisional headquarters. Okay? Schoenberg, this area right here is going to be the Schnee Eiffel area. So this is going to be where they're up on the line. So the Germans are going to be coming from this direction. Most of the German attacks are going to come up here and down here through a place called Blioff. We'll go there. That's inside Germany. But the idea is being that they want to cut off the Schnee Eiffel, isolate the division up here, and then take St. Vith, and then on the Bastogne, which is about 42, 45 kilometers. How far is it from Hernbach down the south of Schoenberg? How many clicks? Hernbach, this is going to be. Well, we've got, what, five, two, and, what do you think, Joseph? About 2,000 meters? What's this? Schoenberg, the very spot right here. What's good is this? This is going to be the main fighting line. What we're going to do, though, is after we leave St. Beast, we'll go up and around because up here I want to show you the entrenchments for the engineers that formed the last blocking position when they were trying to defend St. Beast. Then we'll go up here to Wareth because I want to show you the monuments of some black GIs that were murdered because uh, they got caught by some SS troops and turned over by the Belgians. Then we'll go down the Schnee Eiffel and visit the fortifications and some other part of No, they were part of a core level okay. artillery unit. Okay. So you said something about the inadequacy of, of the uh, radio communications. Did you discover that now or later? Well, we'll get to Jones's headquarters. Same booth is right here. Okay. I want to get a blue card. General Jones is going to have his headquarters set up. So I'm going to show you this, but then you can pass it around. This is a picture of St. Beef by the end of the battle. That one's in our Jeez. Okay. Artillery rounds, everything. Wow. Okay, so just after 5.30 in the morning, the German barrage is going to open up. It's going to start hitting the front lines and it's going to start hitting here at St. V. And 
Jones wires back to Middleton, phones back to Middleton and Bastone and says we're, we're taking heavy shell fire. And he's told, don't worry, it's just a spoiling attack. And he says, there are 14 inch shells falling on my position. That's not a spoiling attack. Something's happening. <laughs> now, I don't think the Germans had anything of that large a caliber, but there's so many shells falling in the town, he just knows he's getting hammered and he's hammered hard. So, right after the barrage, the Germans are going to attack and they're going to start hitting both sides of the Schnee Eiffel to cut off the two regiments that are up there in position. So pretty soon what's going to start happening is Germans are going to start coming towards St. Vith proper. Jones is going to take the uh, instruments away from the divisional band, the cooks, the MPs, everybody, and send them out on roadblocks. He also has some engineer troops that he's going to send out on some roadblocks, and we're going to go up to where the engineer troops were. So almost immediately, he's going to be defending the town while he's also trying to command the division. Um, by the end of the sixth that evening, his troops are still holding their own. He thinks that the situation is manageable, and again he talks to Middleton, and Middleton is going to send them a few tanks from 9th Armored Division. This is going to continue on the next morning, but by that point, 14th Cavalry Group and 18th Cavalry Group have just disappeared, and his troops are going to start getting surrounded. He's going to wire, he's going to talk to Middleton again, and Middleton is going to say, we've got a combat command of the 7th Armored that's going to reach you. So he says, okay, when they get up here, I'm going to have them launch a counterattack. The reports he's getting from up on the Schnee Eiffel that the positions are under threat, he says, just hold them, relief is on the way. Everything's okay. There's an intelligence officer who's a liaison between 8th Corps and Jones at the headquarters, and he hears this conversation. And he doesn't tell Jones that 7th Armored Division is too far away to reach him the next day. And then after the war, this guy admits that he didn't want to say anything to Jones because he didn't want to make Middleton look like a liar. Now, you know, again, I don't know exactly what the environment was like in Middleton's headquarters, but that's clearly a failure of leadership, and I would pin it on Middleton, because Middleton should have fostered a sense amongst his staff that they could tell him what was really going on. What? Chris, quick question. What? If this was such a critical juncture, why would you take a, a draft D division and put it at a critical point versus they, guys that have been in the field like the 2nd ID or the 99th? Why not move them up here? They, were just, they were just closer when they pulled these guys off the line elsewhere. They were just closer. 2nd ID had been on the line here, yeah. but they were going to be sent up north because they planned on attacking the Roar Dams and finishing up the leftovers of the Hurkin. And there just happened to be a gap in the line. They said it's a fresh division. Things have been quiet for a while. So they park them up here. But I do kind of pin the lily on Middleton here because that intelligence officer should have felt comfortable enough to tell Jones that's not going to happen. You know, I don't think Middleton was deliberately lying. I think in the midst of this whole offensive, he had so much stuff going on that he just knew that they were coming. So, but based on that information, Jones is going to direct his two regiments that are trapped up on the Schnee Eiffel to attack towards where he believes the 7th Armored is going to come, and they're going to start shifting to the northwest. While that, while that happens, he's again going to talk to Middleton and say, you know, we're going to meet the Armored Division. But things are getting hairy. Um, I might have to pull out, pull these two regiments back. And because of faulty communications, they're having this conversation, and Middleton is saying, well, we really need you to stay. And then there's a break. And Middleton doesn't know they're a break, and he says, but if things are that bad, pull them out. Jones never gets the word. So all he knows is he suspects that there's army that's gonna come and relieve him, so he's gonna launch an attack to try to meet this armored force. <clears throat> then, he's eventually going to realize 7th Armored can't get up here, and this is a mistake on his part. <clears throat> By this point, the infantry 
infantry up there has been separated from its artillery. It's all alone. They position themselves to, to attack in one direction, and he says, "No, I want you to attack, bust out directly westwards." So they're going to have to. In that that night, now they've been getting hammered. All new guys, very little command and control, no communication between the two regiments that are up there. A very poor communication, and they're going to try to shift their positions southward to attack in a totally different direction, which is absolutely impossible given the Germans that are coming around. So there's a big mess up there. When we get up there, um, you'll see what happens. But there were some more questions about communications. Again, they had the radios, but they hadn't calibrated them properly, and there were some problems with that. The Germans had also jammed a lot of the radio frequencies. There were limited phone lines that ran back from the Schnee Eiffel back to here, but in the barrage, most of them had been cut. So he's relying on runners, the occasional phone connection. Um, the second division had sound powered phones, but they took them with them when they left. Um, so communications is really bad. And I wanted John to talk about, you know, landline, sound powered, and radio, since he worked with it, and he can tell you what works and what doesn't and why, and then we'll go up up into the woods. Well, actually, the best form of communications back then was the wire. But with all that shelling and everything, the wires are out. And the guys are out there trying to fix them. I have done it myself many times. But you get you will get it repaired, and you could get whatever you were trying to get on one end, but you couldn't get the other end. And as far as those walkie-talkies, forget it. I mean, uh, if if you're in woods or anything, they, they don't even work. Sound power is good if you have it, but what radio was not the best. The best communication back then, at that time, was the wire. John, what is sound sound? What's power? a sound-powered phone, John? Well, it's usually used up between platoons and whatnot. You hooked up. And um, you don't know ringing, you blow into it, and they hear you on the other end. It's it's the sound power is to be up close to the front lines, but you don't hear you don't get a ring when you get it on the phone or the switchboard. You, the guy's just blowing it, and you hear that little. So you, and it's a butterfly switch, so you go you talk back, back and forth. But again, that's still wired, but it's just by sound. It doesn't go by. Uh, okay. But it's usually used between platoons uh, and squads, not too much uh, uh, between Just companies shorter and distances. battalions. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, how's it powered? It's got to have a... I, I'm not sure on this because I never use the damn things. But it, ha it has to have some kind of a battery source uh, to, 